This is Sandra Tanner, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. Sharon Flynn worked closely with Mark Hoffman and knows him better than most other people. In this conversation, we'll talk about how Mark got started as a teenager in forgeries and how he tried to fool the Library of Congress for over a million dollars. But before we get to that, I want to thank some contributors who have donated money to us, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, David. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, Carol. Really, really appreciate that. I'd also like to see if you guys wanted to ask any questions and we'll try to post them on the air. Or if you would like to do as Sandra Tanner did, just introduce yourself as a listener of Gospel Tangents. That'll be pretty cool. By the way, Sandra will be a future interviewer, so just keep that in mind. Now, check out our conversation. Well, welcome. I'm excited to be here with Shannon Flynn. Um, if those of you remember my Kurt Bench interview from a few months ago, Shannon uh, knew Mark very well. And so wanted to talk a little bit about the Mark Hoffman bombings uh, with Shannon and, and talk about his relationship with him and, you know, even uh, how, how Mark beat the polygraph test, which I think is going to be an interesting thing. So what I'd like to do uh, to start out here, Shannon, is just tell us how, how did you get acquainted with Mark in the first place? Well, I had a real interest in church history, doctrine, theology, that sort of thing. And... Um, I had met a person named Lynn Jacobs. We went to the same singles ward in Rose Park. And uh, at that time, probably 1983, um, I mean, Mark Hoffman, Hoffman's name was very common in the church history circles and that sort of thing. And I am not sure how Mark and Lynn ever met, but I met Mark through Lynn Jacobs. I was introduced to him and, and so had I think I had met him at towards the end of 1983. Okay. Something like that. Okay. So I'm trying to remember. It seems like Mark, you were just showing me a document there. He said that he started his, his forgery crimes, I think, in 1980. So he was well underway when you met him. Well, significantly so. And actually, uh, I mean, that's kind of an important point. One of the things we were looking at, he actually started forging coins first. And his first corn forgery was when he was 12 years old. And I believe the first time he ever uttered a forgery, in other words, other than just something for doing himself, was when he was 14 years old. And he had learned through a process of trial and error how to add mint marks to legitimate coins. And so he would buy a legitimate coin, maybe a penny something, that had no mint mark on it, and then was able to put a mint mark on it that would significantly increase its value. So the penny was real and legitimate. The only thing that wasn't was just that little mint mark. And uh, as he described afterwards, you know, in the interviews and so forth that he had done uh, with, with the county attorney's office, um, that's the way he got into the Mormon document world. It was from coins to Mormon money Mormon documents and then to American documents. So it was kind of a natural progression through there. Uh, but he had been forging stuff for a long time. And that particular process of adding that mint mark, it's actually a real piece of metal on there and it's electroplated on. He, he, he told afterwards how he did all that. And it's kind of a complicated process. Nevertheless, the important part here is that the bulk in numbers of his forgeries was actually in coins. And to this day, probably 90% of them have never been discovered. Oh, really? And probably never will. So he said, because um, he started this doing it at 12, was he selling them back then to, for more money? Um, well, eventually that, that took place. And like I say, I think that was when he was 14 that he first uttered, or in other words, sold a, a, a coin. Though, <clears throat> as if I recall this correctly, the first Ford, I mean the first forged coin he ever sold was to Al Rust, but he sold it as a forgery. The only thing that Al Rust didn't know is that 14-year-old kid standing in front of him was the one who had 
made the forgery. So, so he went to Al and said, I've got this forged coin. No, no, no. He said, I bought this coin at a coin show and it's very, you know, I'm really thrilled with it. Al Rust is a very nice person, very caring. And, and so, and he, he liked to help people in the coin collecting world. And so here was this 14 year old kid and, and he, he thought, oh, that, I mean, that's fine. He had no suspicion, but he took it in the back and Al maintained, and I don't know if he still does, a whole collection of coin forgeries to use as exemplar so he could, you know, check it to see. So he took it in the back and got his eye loop out and looked at it. And he came back and he said, I think there's something wrong with this coin. He said, the mint mark doesn't look quite right. He said, I can't tell how it's attached because that trick had been tried before, but they would glue it on, but that would leave a little edge that you could see under magnification. And he said, I can't see any edge, but the shape of it is just not right. And he actually felt sorry for this poor kid because he figured that he had gone to some coin show and gotten taken by an unscrupulous dealer. And so he said, I'll buy it from you. Probably not for what the real value of it was, but at least so, you know, and he was one trying to encourage the kid to not just, oh, this is a terrible hobby and I'm going to quit and never do it again. Like I say, the only thing he didn't know was that kid forced it. Wow. But what that told him was, oh, my technique is almost right, but not quite. It started a chain of events that throughout his life, he has been, inc Mark has been incredibly lucky. He could have been caught many times before he was, but he just kept getting lucky over and over and over. So did basically Mark keep going to Al Rust and improving his technique essentially until he bought something that he thought was legitimate that was forged? Right. And then he was kind of home free because then he could be a coin dealer, and he did. Um, I'll try to get it to some to you somehow. I have one of Mark's business cards when he was a teenager and he's a, it says coin collector and the name of his business was Mark's Mint Mistakes. And what he dealt was his anomalies, you know, things that were misstamped, misprinted, and that's kind of a subset of the the coin collecting and paper money collecting world and that's what he specialized in. Well what he really specialized in was buying a fifty dollar penny and turning it into a thousand dollar penny or a fifty you know a twenty five dollar silver dollar piece and turning it into a five thousand dollar silver dollar piece. Um, and I can just take a second here. There's an easy way to detect that forgery. If you put that coin on a block of dry ice it cools the coin very quickly and that little mint mark will flake off. Well, the reason I said that most of his forgeries will never be detected is because those things now in the ensuing years have been bought and sold and bought and sold all over the United States. And so, and since there isn't really a, a pedigree so much for them, I guess you could come up with it. I bought it from this dealer and you know, you could probably figure it out. Uh, some of those would be so terribly complicated, no one's ever going to do it. But the simple solution is for any collector to take all of his coins and put them on a block of dry ice. They don't want to do it. Nobody wants to do it. That's, that would be a pretty it. inexpensive way to figure it out, right? Well, but then that coin you paid $5,000 for is now worthless. And that just says something about the way the world is and the way things work to a huge extent. I bet there's some collectors that have done that, but my estimation is most haven't and they don't want to know. Hmm. <laughs> wow. So that's interesting. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Shannon Flynn. In our next conversation, we'll talk about Mark's personality. He must have been a pretty slick character in order to get away with these forgeries for so long. Was he very charismatic? Nowadays, you would, you would kind of see him as a computer nerd. Um, uh, he was not charismatic in the least. Click here to subscribe. Click here for a transcript. And over here, you'll see some other videos that we've done here on YouTube. We hope you'll use this as a valuable resource to learn more about Mormon history.